Good evening, Art History One. I hope you are doing fantastically well. And greetings from the steps of the Pantheon, one of the greatest artistic and architectural compliment, accomplishments of ancient Rome. Um, today, we will actually be spending the day actually looking at architecture that leads us up to this great accomplishment. Remember from our last lecture where we talked about that the way that the Romans really truly do look at art is that they look at the Greek style of sculpture, which they basically inherit, but they consider those individuals craftsmen and don't give them a lot of credit. If you want your name to know through, be known throughout history, really architecture is where the, the action is in ancient Rome. If you're a female, you can also be an artist, but not an architect, you might be able to be a poet. So as we look at Roman architecture, let me share my screen with you. If you want to be an artist in ancient Rome, you would want to be an architect. That's really where the action is actually taking place, unless you are a female and then you are a poet. There are many emperors that basically make the claim that I found ancient Rome made of wood and I left it made of concrete or I left it made of marble. Talk about how they beautify the city itself. Rome is the first city state that we ever get that reaches a million population. And largely that's going to be because we're going to invent or perfect the aqueduct and the plumbing situation. Once you get to this level, if you look around, there's no farmland within the city with a million people living here, which means that the farmland is well outside of the city. Now, unless you have a day job and can travel outside of the city and back to tend your field, it means someone else is going to have to tend those fields, which means you need to earn a job that is going to allow you then to buy produce, to buy product. So this is the first civilization we have where we don't have a dominance of agricultural farmers that make subsistence, um, subsistence agriculture and then sell the rest for a job. They have separate jobs. And that's what Rome is going to invent. Now the Roman architect that we need to work with um, more than any other is Vitruvius. And his our famous architectural monument, his book is called De Architectura. And basically he defines architecture as having three foundational principles. Firmitas, meaning durable, utilitas, useful, venustas, beautiful. <laughs> and still today, this is how we define architecture. Most of you have probably heard of Leonardo da Vinci's perfect man, the Vitruvian man. That is based upon the ideas and concepts that come out of Vitruvius here in the Architectura. Rome, as we talked about last time, here are the aesthetics. And specifically, if we scroll down to architecture, <coughs> excuse me, we scroll down to architecture here. There we go. Architecture was the most important art form. Concrete structure decorated with marble. They are going to be the civilization that invents concrete and learns how to use it. They're going to have open spaces that are emphasized. Domes and arches, much more than we've seen in any other form of an architecture. And finally, they're going to actually look at mathematical rather than optical perfection. So to show you the impact that their architecture has, most important aspects of architecture can really be summed up here. So this is the Pont de Garde. This basically means the bridge over the Garde River, and it is a part of the Roman aqueduct system. Now, under that right-hand corner, you'll see the clean water and sanitation. That is a, another United Nations Sustainable Development Goal. We have not seen this one, but clean water and sanitation revolutionized the world. For those of you that have never lived in a society without clean water, or without clean sanitation, um, it really is a remarkable feature because just the idea of going down to the water well to get your water, coming back, boiling it um, before you can do anything else and not just turning on the tab might cost you anywhere from an hour to two hours per day. And remember, without clean running water, you easily can die within three days, maybe four days if you're lucky, depending upon the heat of the climate itself. So it is one of those foundations of life that shows up. How the architecture or how the arch works, and note the arch, the arch here is the new innovation, a series of arches together, such as we have here, arch, 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 is called an arcade. So that's a series of arches. The arches are actually pretty easy to make because once you get your main verticals of porch, again, the posts, you're going to take these individual rocks, voissoirs, and you actually don't need to know that terminology, but the terminology you should know is the keystone. Once you lock the keystone in place, it basically all those others become in place. Now, you do not use concrete on an arch, 
And what allow, that allows is that during an earthquake or other movement, the different rocks can move. As long as the keystone, which is a little bit larger, stays locked in place, that arch will hold. And that's why there's a number of architectural feats from ancient Rome, everything from the aqueducts all the way to the arches from the Colosseum that still stand today. The arches is a very remarkable invention. Now, you want to be careful. The Romans do not invent the arch. They actually perfect it. The people who are generally given credit are the Carthaginians, who is one of Rome's enemies that live in North Africa. And so they're going to invent plumbing. They're going to invent, not just plumbing, but they're going to invent arch to carry that plumbing. And when they do, the Romans are going to take that idea and run with it and really create a remarkable style of architecture. Even the word architecture comes from the idea of building with arches. Think about architecture. Now, for us, the Romans are going to have to solve a problem. And the problem they're going to have to solve, remember, goes back to human body architecture. There's a masculine column. That's the Dora column. That's the spear bear, masculine, giant head, very Doric kind of body going down. You have the Ionic column with the lovely volutes, the small capital for the small head, the intasis with the swelling of the hips going down. So we have a masculine and a feminine column. The problem is, besides them both being made of marble, which is a fragile material, if you just push on a Doric column and have it locked up, or on the mass or on the feminine um, ionic column, they will both shake. And as soon as they shake and the head moves, as soon as you see that head move, the roof falls in. And so there's not a lot of consistent architecture from the ancient Greek world that is still in good condition. They live in a largely earthquake zone. So any natural disaster is really going to put pressure on this. The arch is going to solve this problem. Why, how the arch solves it is that you take these two different columns, and even using your hands, if you put them together in front of your face. Now, imagine that your fingernails that overlap right there, that's the keystone. So the keystone has flexibility, it can move up and down. So if you put them down on the table and just move them around a little bit, you'll notice that they're actually very, very stable. If you do the same thing with the Doric column or with the lovely Ionic column there and just push it, you can see how it moves on the top. Every time it does that, that is actually the, the roof falling in of these buildings. These buildings are so easy to make, or actually the, the arch itself is so easy to make, that Roman centurion soldiers, when they are not fighting, they were building aqueducts and irrigation channels. So this is a remarkable feature. Let's say you lose a war to the Romans. Besides them charging you the 10% of the taxes that they charge everyone within the Roman Empire, they're then going to build for you almost immediately a running water source, a life-giving water, a clean water, of water that comes from the mountains, that had, does not have disease, that you don't have to boil. And so what's going to happen? Your children are going to be healthier. Your elderly are going to live longer. Your quality of life is going to go up. You're going to be sick less often. Your productivity is going up. And so, yes, the Romans are giving you something, knowing that your productivity is going up. And because your children are going to be healthier and probably live longer, maybe even live throughout their childhood age, which killed so many millions of children before this, you're going to want to be Roman. You're going to want what they have. That clean running water in the aqueducts is a pretty remarkable feature. Also, if you have drought, they give you irrigation channels so that you don't starve because you can still grow your crops through their irrigation. The arch is basically better because of the following then. The arch is stronger, the arch is cheaper. It allows vibration, and so in earthquakes or natural disasters, it's not as catastrophic. And some of these even, it's even survived bombings in World War II. It's easier to make. You and I, if we had a template to put up, could actually make an arch in your backyard any weekend just by having the keystone there. It uses less material, and anyone can make it. Now, traditionally, as we talked about in the Greek architecture, for the Ionic column, you have massive columns, a little bit of space, massive columns. So maybe you get six feet in between the columns. So it really is about being overarching and being watched. Um, so like, it's like having a phalanx or a military presence around you. The Ionic column for museums, they're thinner, but we might get 10 to 12 feet of space in between them. Maybe we have a long run of wood that we put overhead that shows up. The remark remarkable feature of the arch is that the length and the expanse that we're going to have is enormous. So in the arch, besides it being stronger, cheaper, allowing vibration, 
easier to make, uses less material than anyone can make. It ends up being, and these arches right here over a river that allow a river to flow through it, each one of those arches is 82 feet wide. So you would imagine that would be six Doric columns between each one, maybe eight or five or somewhere in that neighborhood Ionic columns between each one. So this is going to give us a much different sense of spatial awareness in terms of architecture. So are the impacts of clean running aqueduct water, that clean sanitation, even into the modern day world? No surprise, the implications are the following. First off, Rome is going to be our first truly mega city, an urban civilization is created. It's going to be the first 1 million population city. We're going to have healthier, more productive citizens. We're going to be able to live closer together. In fact, we're going to make five story apartment buildings. Our life expectancy is going to rise. We're not going to have farmland, so that means we're going to have to create jobs and have jobs that allow us to buy produce that we would normally have that comes from our own farmlands. We're going to need jobs to buy few food and new occupations. So if you look around, think about the new occupations. We're going to need to have plumbers, right, that are running with the aqueduct water. We're going to need to have fast food restaurants. We're going to need to have markets or grocery stores. We're going to need to have a, a supply chain management that brings the food in before it rots. We're going to need places to store the food. We are going to need someone to actually count the food and basically the stock of what the food's holding. We're going to need someone to teach them. We're going to need someone to write the business contract. So now we're going to need lawyers. When people get sick, they're not going to be able to go out and find their own herbs. They're going to have to go to a doctor or a pharmacist. So all these new occupations are going to invent or be invented and be basically creating the first mega city. That's what Rome represents. A city just like Miami, just like Chicago, New York, just without electricity. So here's what the Rome main market now looks like. You have these large scale market on a daily basis that you would go and get your fruits and your vegetable that will be brought in from the countryside. And I will mention this main market was really for the upper class. So this is the nice beautiful buildings you can see around it, the temples on the hill. This is really for the, the rich and the upper middle class. Wealthy Roman homes were called domuses, and that's where we get the word domicile. If you want to go back to your domicile, another name for your home. You can see the sleeping rooms are on top. There's business offices. You, can, you could potentially have shop front stores out in front, depending upon what your profession. There's dining rooms, and the farther you go into the domicile, the more limited the access is. So generally, men that were coming in to do business were allowed in the first section, but generally were not allowed into the, the bedrooms, the courtyards in the back where your women and children actually would be, um, and where your servants would be taking care of things. Note the difference here, right offside the temple, this is a subura. This is basically where we get the word suburban, or that next element out outside of a, the urban area would be, you know, the next area, kind of like Kendall is to Miami. And so these would be more poor suburban areas of Rome where bargains are to be found. But note, this is also gonna be where the prostitution um, and thieves' quarters are. You have to be much more careful. If there's public demonstrations about the poor, they're all going to take place in this particular area, which is right off the market. Now, whatever food doesn't sell at the main market for the upper class and the middle class is probably bought here for day-old sale the next day for the, the more poor individuals. And here's where the poor individuals are going to live. They're going to live in basically what the early version of tenement housing. Now, there's storefronts on the bottom, and then on the next levels up, and they can be up to five stories. You will note they are actually running water in some capacity coming in, or at least in the local area. You can see them collecting the running water here. But when they're done with their running water, they're just going to chuck it out in the poor neighborhoods. In a wealthier home, you would actually have your own running water um, that runs in and takes the garbage out, so you're a lot less likely to get sick. Here in the more subura um, areas or the suburban areas, you're much more likely to get sick because we just don't have running water in every neighborhood yet. The Rome is just couldn't afford it. It's pretty expensive to make, particularly over already existing conditions. There's another version of it where, again, you see the shops, the cheaper shops on the bottom, pe people generally drying their clothes on that second floor, but that's also their living, of, living um, equality. So looking at reduced inequalities, the ancient Romans had an upper class, a middle class, and a poorer class, just like we have today. Now, outside of this, you can see um, the Flavian Amphitheater, the Colosseum, or the Arena. All three names are correct. And in fact, 
In the ancient world, they would have called this the Flavian Amphitheater. The word arena actually means sand in Latin, very close to arena, um, from Spanish here as well. And that is because the interior of this would have been filled with about a foot of sand. And when did you need to know to change the sand over, that it was too dirty? That you would dig into the sand, the people that worked there, and if they couldn't find anything that wasn't pink, meaning that it had already been bloodied, that they needed to change the sand over. So as soon as you found, found bloody sand going all the way down, you would basically have a naval battle or have an overnight where you wash that sand out to sea. Now the Colosseum is a great form of propaganda. And here's the actual long-winded definition of propaganda that I have over here that I'll share with you. So we talk about propaganda from the Roman Empire and where we are with it today. Propaganda is communication aimed at influencing the attitude of community towards some cause or position. As opposed to providing information, propaganda in its most basic sense presents information primarily to influence an audience. Propaganda often presents facts selectively, thus lying by omission, to encourage a particular synthesis, or uses loaded messages to produce an emotional rather than rational response to the information presented. That is exactly what the Colosseum represents. It is propaganda. The Colosseum is built on the remains of an imperial family that was not very much liked during the Roman Empire. It actually is built on a lake. And so the later emperors, the Flavians themselves, that's why it's called the Flavian Amphitheater, who become an imperial power and start ruling the, the emperor's throne for a number of years. They actually take the land of the previous emperor and they give a portion of it to make the Colosseum basically as a gift, telling you, we know how bad the earlier emperors were. Here's our gift to you to show you that we have your interest at heart. In reality, they did not. The Colosseum, while as a gift, they were worried about being overthrown. And so it was given as a gift, but in each section of the Colosseum on the interior, as we'll see in a moment, they would actually place spies that would sit there and listen to make sure people weren't thinking about revolting against the, the imperial powers that happened to be there. So this is really Big Brother watching you while you're watching death and destruction. The Flavian Amphitheater, or the Colosseum of the Arena, this is also the first national anthem. Remember, last from last time, when, it, when the Romans established their tiny city-state of Rome, Romulus renames this tiny city um, Rome, and they at that point believe in manifest destiny that this entire Mediterranean Sea is going to be ours. That's kind of delusional. I mean, think about today. We live in Miami. Let's think in Miami that all of a sudden one day we have this, this vision that anything that the Atlantic Ocean touches, that's going to be ours. That would be the whole East Coast of the United States, Canada, Europe, and Africa. We think that's ours, and eventually we get there. That's what the Romans get. And as such, they invent the first national anthem that's called Mare Nostrum, Our Sea, which I'd like to play for you. They would play this national anthem before any of their sporting or gladiatorial contests, the same way that we do before our sporting contests, whether it's hockey, This goes from an album called Singara. And you'll notice it's all instrumental. And also, it's either a fifth or a seventh rather than based upon eighths. And so it sounds a little discordant to our ears. And the instruments you see above, those are those two instruments. It's a double reeded flute that they're playing and a drum, which is about to kick in here. And people would stand during the national anthem. The only thing that would go before the national anthem is generally the emperor, if he was in attendance in a place like the Colosseum, would give an address.
And so like at the end of our national anthem, we would clap, we would celebrate, we would actually show our national heritage, our national pride. It was a way of binding the entire empire together. Now, when you go to the Coliseum, one of the things you'll notice from the outside, first off, on the right-hand side, you'll see where it's been stripped of its marble. One of the things that's interesting is that the Coliseum is so supportive today, not because of it's made of marble, because of it's made of heavy duty, sturdy concrete. Still the, the way that we make the world today is largely in concrete. And so some people say, all right, well, we're still living the iron age. When many people are saying, no, it's really the age of concrete because our building material is primarily concrete. It's what allows us to survive in Miami when hurricanes would blow down any wooden structure we could devise in almost any level. And so on the left-hand side is the decorated outside. It's about half of it that's left. On the right-hand side is the original concrete. When you go to the Coliseum, you can see both of these. You'll notice on the very bottom, as you can see in the drawing in the middle, you're going to have the Doric column from the Greeks, followed by the Ionic column, followed by the Corinthian column, followed all the way at the top, so four different levels on the Corinthian pilasters, which are basically non-functional at all. They serve as decorations. And the question is, why have them in this order? Right, so we're going to have the Doric masculine one supporting everything on the bottom, paying homage to the Greeks, the foundation of the civilization that you borrowed. The Ionic, the next one up, that female kind of gender role stereotype that shows up that we still have today. So that's the female column, also from the Greeks. Then we have Corinthian, invented by the Greeks, but remember, used by the Romans. And on the top, just the decoration of the pilasters themselves. And so it does go through the process of who's probably sitting on the different levels as well. So the interior and the exterior work together. The Flavian Amphitheater was renamed the Colosseum after Emperor Nero created the largest bronze sculpture in antiquity of himself by the Colosseum. Here's a recreation of that. And note, this is Nero making himself look like the sun god Helios. <laughs> note how similar that would be then actually to our Statue of Liberty if it was in a bay. Large bronze, bay, bronze sculpture standing out looking over and watching guard for all people who want to come into the vicinity. So even though we borrowed our idea from the Colossus of Rhodes, uh, the Romans borrowed it for other artworks such as Emperor Nero here. And it doesn't last very long under Emperor Nero. Now, Nero is seen as the sun god Helios, the light. It was destroyed during the sack of Rome. It, Nero was actually a fairly beloved god, um, or a fairly loved king god, as the emperors all were, by the lower class. And that's because he promoted arts and theaters that were loved by the commoners. And he really did try to do a fair amount for the commoners. The problem, of course, is he not, did not do that much for the military and for the upper class. So if you look at over here on this, he holds a rudder on a circular globe showing Rome's power over land and over sea. And there is a, a comic that shows up, says that Nero fiddled while Rome burned. That just isn't true. That was a story that his later enemies created, and his enemies created on some of the power. Why they were of the upper class, that they felt they were being ignored, and Nero was much more supporting the arts and the theater that were loved by the commoners. So we've got to be careful with what stories we take from history. Remember, to the victor goes the spoils, and eventually Nero is going to be one of the most hated emperors of all time because the upper class is going who owns the media outlets and who owns any newspaper who owns the Colosseum, they are the individuals that are actually going to be able to spread this story. And the commoners, if you hear it enough, are gonna slowly come to accept that story. So we have to be very careful when we talk about media bias. And again, this brings us to the another United Nations Sustainable Development Goal, one we've actually seen before. And this is peace, justice, and strong institutions. Nero's high ranking enemies spread this rumor about him to try and get the Roman mob to attack him. And of course they did not because they knew the Roman mob himself, they knew that he was a pretty good guy for the, the lower class and for common folk. And the question back then, just as today is, can you trust your media? And the question of course then becomes, which media? Because we tend to have a tendency to go to the media that already supports what we believe. Those people that are a little bit more liberal or very liberal go to CNN, MSNBC. Those people that are a little bit more conservative or very conservative, go to Fox News or One American News, OAN. And the question is, one of the issues that shows up is sometimes they don't even cover the same stories. So it's not even that they are misleading us. It's that by not 
covering the same stories or the same issues or with the same intensity, no one is really getting the truth of the whole way that things work out in American society. That's a major issue because a democracy only functions if you have an engaged electorate. 98%, think about that today. And some people will put that number as low as 93%. So we can use 93 or 98% of all media in the United States is controlled by eight companies. That is an asinine statistic. We include Facebook and Google, GE, News Corp, Disney. Look at what Disney owns, just to put in perspective. They own ABC, ESPN, Pixar, Miramax, Marvel Studios. They're buying more and more of Sony. They are looking at buying out different aspects of Fox and Fox News. And so the commentary on the right is perfect. You write what, we're, you write what you're told. Thanks, corporate news. We couldn't control the people without you. So if 98% of the news media is controlled by just a couple families or by a couple of corporations, how, how do we know that they are not actually acting in their own best interest with, because they are corporations to make money rather than to give us the actual news? And the truth is now over history, we've done these surveys and researches, we don't. Each time the Senate um, and the House of Representatives or our Congress allows these companies to merge, it verifies and makes it really much easier for them to control all the news. So how do you know all the news that's fit to print? It's basically what these eight companies tell us is fit to print, is fit to be heard. So if you look at the breakdown, so it used to be that we, we could respond and have the nightly news at 6 p.m. 30 years ago and everyone accepted CBS, NBC, ABC, they covered the same news stories in the same way. It really depended upon which personality you like better, you know, that you would go and actually get your news from. Now, look at how it's spread out. There's very few news sources, very few, that are original fact reporting neutral. That would be this exact green box up here, all the way at the top, right here. Now, original fact reporting, there's very little of them. Almost all of them do some fact reporting, but they also have opinion pieces. And so they're going to skew liberal or skew conservative right from the get-go. Rather than allowing the American population to hear the facts and make up their own mind, we're going to interpret the facts for them because we have actually turned news into corporations, which it used to be just a public service. So very different within the process. You can notice media bias chart shows CNN absolutely skewing on the liberal side. It shows Fox News even more in the hyper-partisan side on the conservative side. But if you look, you'll see almost all the news that we get then, until we get to really almost the red rectangle down here, which is very close to propaganda, which basically means they show you only one side of the story at all. And that is a problem in running with a democracy. So how do you know you're getting the actual news? If you don't listen to both news sources, you simply don't. And even if you don't listen to both news sources, or you might actually get different stories. So a couple of weeks ago, I watched Fox News um, one night for the entire night, and I had taped and I had watched um, MSNBC and NBC at the MSNBC and CNN. And what I will tell you is that about one out of every two stories that they covered were completely different stories. The other group didn't even talk about them. And the other half, the radical bias in, in both aspects was so much so that they basically gave us different takes on the news story. So I was left as the viewer trying to figure it out myself. That's really hard to have in democracy where people don't have that kind of time to figure out. So what do you do? You go to the people who news source you trust or you've been taught from your parents, but they're giving you a, a most people, unless they're in the screen box, no, and that's the AP where everyone gets their news reporting from, Reuters, AFP, Bloomberg, unless it's one of those four, they're almost all biased within the process. And so you're getting a biased news source. It's a problem in a democracy. Continuing on that, and the idea of propaganda, remember the Coliseum was made for propaganda. Here's the Coliseum on the interior. It's a beautiful building, it's still functional. Note the stone, the stone seating, like we saw in amphitheaters. The major difference is basically two amphitheaters or two theaters seeing places put together. That doesn't allow some of the sound to, to jump out, to kind of escape. And so that means that the vibration and the interlude that, that allowed a speaker in a theater to actually talk in a normal voice to be heard, we're no longer gonna have it because if the sound can't actually escape, that needs to escape. So now we're gonna need a ruckus roar and we're gonna need people heralds in different sections 
that might need to yell out, or we have to make this a visual spectacle. And that basically is what's become a sporting contest in the stadiums before we develop much more complicated um, stereo systems and electricity that shows up. You can see the floor here is covered at least partially with wood. That wood right here, that's where the sand would have gone on. And as soon as all the sand had a little bit of paint, you would have actually washed it with water, which I'll show you how you could wash it with water. And you would flush out all of that dirty sand. And the next day you'd have a naval battle or you'd have a day off. And then the next day you could actually fill it again, or you could turn off the water valves, put down the planks again, and put a, a foot of sand, and you could actually have sand battles in here the next day. So it's a pretty versatile building. Here's us standing over, me and my little guys, actually one headed off to college, the other one actually a sophomore now in high school. They grow up so fast. Inside the Coliseum, look at the spectacle that you can have from a day-to-day -day perspective. It's pretty amazing. So we can slaughter the Christian martyrs, Remember, we're going to slaughter the Christian martyrs because when you take them over, there are two things that Rome demands. Number one, they're going to demand that you actually pay your 10% taxes. Almost everyone is willing to do this to the Roman Empire. It's painful at first, but then when you realize you get free um, running water, healthy water that's going to keep your kids and you healthier over time, irrigation, and you get insurance so that if your crops fail, they'll bring in crops from another part of the Roman Empire to make sure that you and your family don't starve as part of the taxation, it's not bad for 10%. The part that people have problems with, and this is why the Christians have problems with the Romans and the Romans have problems with the Christians which are developing during this time period, is they also demand that you say that Jupiter, their high God, is also your high God. That's their Zeus in terms of kind of the Greek culture. And that poses a major issue because Christians can't do that without blaspheming. And that's why we have the martyrdom that takes place. Now, isn't it weird that we would have defenseless people being eaten by lions and you would have a crowd in the background of 50,000 people cheering on the lions and cheering on death. Um, it's a pretty brutal culture when we actually look at it. On the upper right-hand corner, you could have battle with exotics, including elephants, rhinoceros, giraffes. You could have gladiatorial combat like you'll see in the very bottom. You can have military training exercises, particularly on holy days, where you actually have the day off and you invite a large crowd to see the military training exercise, almost like parades. There are female gladiators. They're almost always the undercard, and they always fight other female gladiators. And at the very bottom, what's amazing is you can have naval battles, full-scale naval battles. And you can fit six ancient Roman ships that can actually fight with one another to reenact a naval battle that you want so you can reenact real armies attacking one another. How do you do this? If you come down to this lovely diagram right here, where my cursor is, this area right here, see these holes right there, right there, right there, see the holes that are around those? Those are actually connected to the aqueduct system. So when you want, are done with your gladiatorial games during the day and you want to actually have a naval battle at night, you turn on the water from the aqueduct system and it will slowly flood. This will sink underneath the sand, underneath the wood, and flood the underneath of what, and I'll show you that, the underbelly of where the gladiators and the exotic animals are kept. And overnight, it will flood up to about 18 feet. When you get to 18 feet, you shut off the nozzle, and now you can have your military battle. When you're done with your military battle, your naval battle, you'll actually open up the aqueduct system and you will allow all of that effluence and all of the death and the blood and anything that you can't remove, any dead animal carcasses, any poop, any smell, any sand with the paint will actually wash out the sea. And that's literally how they do it. So it's our first multi-purpose building, all available because concrete is a non-porous material or semi-porous material for what they had. There are different styles of gladiator and you would train as a different style of gladiator if you were a gladiator. Many of the gladiators were slaves, but willing men could actually become gladiators. And gladiators became so powerful that at one point in Roman history, they had to make a rule that senators couldn't also be gladiators because they were worried about a super senator becoming a super gladiator and having so much power that they would be able to overthrow the emperor. And so they made rules about who could be gladiators. So there's different type of weapons and each one has a different type that they would fight. Now, it is a myth that they fought to the death in those contexts. They did not. These are highly appeal, appealing um, sports um, figures. And so you want to basically 
have your investment protected as best you can, particularly in the place like the Coliseum, right? The Coliseum is the Super Bowl for the gladiators. You would have to win <coughs> eight to 10 regional battles to even make it into the Coliseum. And if you won 10 successive Coliseum battles, you would retire at taxpayer expense like a millionaire for the rest of your life. That is the rest of your life. And that is because if another gladiator in the future also won 10 successive battles in the Coliseum, they might bring you back out of retirement, which you don't have a choice for, and you would fight that other person who's perfect. And so to see who the true super gladiator is, now that might not seem fair, but that is actually the system of the gladiatorial system that we have set up. And so I wanna show you one aspect that shows up where you can actually have military battles. And here's the announcer about to announce the, the battle of um, one of the Punic Wars that shows up with the gladiator in attendance. The people that are lower down and actually have the better views, those are actually the wealthy people, the merchants and, and individuals in the, the upper class. Then we've got the middle class, the teachers, the plumbers, the doctors in that next level. And slaves could even afford their own ticket. Slavery back in ancient Rome was not like today. Slaves could actually earn enough money to buy themselves out of slavery after many years or to make their life more palatable by going to the Colosseum or doing other things when they were not busy actually being slaves within the household. So this does come from the movie Gladiator. Hannibal is one of the kings of the Carthaginian Empire, where the Punic Wars took place. So now these are slaves that are being used here according to the movie Gladiator. They do have air conditioning here. If they show you the overall image of the gladiatorial combat area, you'll note the Navy used their sails on the top to be able to shake up and down, which allows some movement of air. There are public restrooms and public toilets here. And here from the movie Gladiator, an individual that has military training is basically saying if we fight together, fight together, basically forms a phalanx formation that allows them to survive. So here's Hannibal's barbarian hordes from North Africa, a city that the Romans are later going to destroy in the Third Punic War. If you don't fight together with in a, a group that's actually fighting and with advanced weaponry and technology, you've got no shot. So you saw the owner of the slaves right there who actually walked up. That's basically an owner's box, like we have an owner's box today um, in modern day stadiums. And watch how they work together. Note the crowd is going crazy. You get to celebrate. You bring your family and worship death on both sides. You can even have your action figure of your favorite gladiator that's going to agree with you to support your gladiator. Note how close you are to the action. Every year or so, some of the wealthy individuals, would, an, an arrow or something would get overthrown and kill someone in the front row, a senator 
or a famous merchant, and the crowd would go crazy, like, oh my god, we just got Bill Gates. <laughs> The Coliseum performances would take place about six days a week. Simply, they were not held on Sunday, God's Day of Rest, later on the Christian faith. Remember, this is uh, the world that invented Christianity, so it might be a direct carryover that shows up. If you like pirates, you'll notice this music was ripped off later on by pirates and pretty. The actor right there, if you don't recognize him, has won a couple of Academy Awards. He's a fantastic actor. His name is Joaquin Phoenix. He actually just won the Academy Award for Joker. So this is blood sport at its best or at its worst, depending upon what you believe. There's the slave owner who just made a lot of money because his slaves won. And note, this was supposed to be a historical reenactment, so it was very much against these individuals that had never worked together, except they had a military hero to bring them all together. And so the emperor is going to lean in and say, hey, is this really, I don't remember the history being like this. Shouldn't the barbarians lose the Battle of Carthage? Ah, uh, yes. Um, and so you could have these wild epics and you would bring your children and you would kind of celebrate. Now remember, if you're talking smack about the emperor or anything during this time period, there are people within the crowd that are actually listening that are paid attendance by the emperor. So they're listening into what you're saying. So they have an idea if there's any revolts going on. The emperors were very worried about being overthrown by actually the general population, the what's called the, the, the Roman mob, or by their own fellow senators, because Julius Caesar was basically brought down by his senators, or by other family members who they believe I could do a better job ruling. So we do have a lot of overthrows that happen, and the emperors are very wary of this. Wealthy people on the bottom, middle class, and then the poor people all the way up the top by where the navy is. If you've ever seen those aspects of where, um, in this movie earlier on, where the Christians are surprised because a lion emerges, emerges up from the very bottom, they have actually set up an elevator system here. Our first elevator system with pulleys is actually set up here in the Colosseum as well. So the truth behind ancient Roman gladiators, I won't show you to this today, but it is here. If you want to go back, it basically goes over a fair amount of the information, including much more on the training information about the gladiators, if you're interested. And just like we did for Rome, we want to have a cultural relativism checklist. The Romans sometimes use urine to whiten their teeth. For those individuals who like whitened teeth, you can imagine using urine. Ancient Roman children's toy was an action figure, which had fully articulated limbs. Here you see one <coughs> of a gladiator. And if your gladiator lost and died at some point during the process, you could actually go to the toy stand and pop off that toy's head and ask for the new glitter. I'd like to have gladiolus, and you would actually pop gladiolus, and now you would have a brand new gladiator. So you have to change the whole figure over just the head. Gladiator sweat up there in the right-hand corner, making Roman women weak in the knees since the first century BC. That should have E on it as well, but making Roman women weak in the knees since the first century. Gladiator sweat was actually collected after a gladiator won a contest and was bottled as perfume. So you could actually buy gladiator sweat. And ladies, you could go home and put it on your body to try to get the pheromones, the hormones, to arouse yourself before you had sex with your husband. And their version of Gatorade is they used to drink pig dung. So pig dung has a very high content, as does elephant dung, with water. So you could wring it out and then literally drink it. And you've got some electrolytes and and. Our, doesn't sound fuzzy to me. I think I'll stick with the Gatorade, but that was what they drank as an energy drink. Underground, the Colosseum, the area that would be flooded with the water. This is where the gladiators would actually come in. This is where the elevator system for, it's also where the elephants, the lions, and all the other exotic animals would be kept. That's why the arches and things are so high. 
um, and then it would be completely cleaned out. Now, normally down here, it would have stank to hyena because you have gladiators who have slaves and you have poop and pee and they live in basically versions of cages. You've got all these animals. It would have been disgusting down here, blood and death. That's why about once a month, maybe once every six weeks, you have a military campaign where you flood it and then you could actually use it as a naval battle and you could actually wash off all that stuff. Interestingly enough, the Romans were so good with math that they had actually figured out a way that when they um, let their water out, it would hit the tide in the Adria, or I'm sorry, um, hit the tide in the Mediterranean Sea, and that poop and all the effluent would float down to Carthage, their major enemy, and basically they were shitting on their enemy. If you don't know, the rivalry between Chicago and St. Louis is the same thing. Chicago reversed the flow of one of their rivers in the early 1900s, late 1800s, because it used to be that they would poop and the river would actually flow out to Lake Michigan. Normally this is a fine, is a fine way because then it would float across and dissipate. But on days when there was a lot of wind and Chicago was known as the Windy City, that poop would flood back to their beaches and make everyone sick. So to prevent this, they actually dug a canal system and sent their poop down the Mississippi River. And at the end of the Mississippi River where the canal system is, is right where St. Louis is today. So that's one of the rivals that developed in sports because literally Chicago was crapping on their enemy. In the Coliseum, this was History Channel's all-time number one killing machine. It held 50,000 spectators. It's the birth of advertising because you need to know who is there before you pay your tickets. They are events five times a week, sometimes six times a week, never on Sunday. The birth of the siesta. So the siesta that we still have in Europe today where shops and everyone closed during lunchtime, schools closed, everyone comes home for the big meal of the day, a much healthier way of eating. That's the birth of this, which took place here. And so the events generally took place from about 12 to three, then you would go back to work. So this is the birth of that siesta that still carries over in a good portion of Europe today. 50,000 people probably died here in this 300 year history, 350 year history, and 10,000 animal deaths, including such exotics as they used to have exotic animal fights of people riding giraffes, fighting people that were riding elephants. There were public toilets, there's elevators, they're made of concrete. The one thing that the Gladiator movie got wrong is that this actually in Gladiator movie um, was, all right, let them live. This is actually let them die. This is a bastardization of their thing. So this would actually be live, which for us, that would mean die in the modern day world for how we hail a taxi and other things. So that is something we just got right. It had or got wrong in the movie. The removal arena sand floor, and there you see the areas for the wealthy, the middle class, the slave area with the navy all the way up top for shade and to shake it so you get a little bit of air conditioning. It's a pretty remarkable building. Today, it is the impact on all Florida stadiums. No matter whether, I know it's hard to be a Miami sports fan right now, hopefully we'll get better in the future. The Florida Panthers are not very good. Miami Dolphins are uh, okay. The Miami Martins are awful. So, but all the stadiums are designed basically based upon the Coliseum. The world's monuments, including the Coliseum, are now being tagged, which poses a major problem because it used to be that any hour of the day you could go see these great monuments and be overwhelmed and walk around and really just have a fantastic time. Now, with people putting graffiti, they're closing them down and it becomes much more expensive because you can't just walk around it. You need to have armed guards, you need to pay for a tour. And so that made, poses a major problem. So a lot of them are being tagged. It's clues of all of these have been tagged in recent years. That's Stonehenge on the upper left-hand corner. Those are the great pyramids at Giza. No, we, people have been tagging those going all the way back into the 1800s. So those are tags from the 1800s. So it's not just a recent phenomenon. It's something that's been going on. But now we have so much better technology that it's way harder to get off spray paint today than it was 20 years ago with chemical compounds. So it's much harder to remove those things. Now, as we're talking about Rome and these other wonderful places, one of the things I want to point out is that travel makes you interesting. So as soon as you have some ability to do some traveling, I would highly recommend this. For most of you, I would recommend this for your junior year abroad. Your junior year abroad, you go somewhere to study and if you take the, if you go with the university where you are currently studying, whatever field it is, you would take your financial aid package with you. So except for the plane ticket to get there, it does not cost you any money. Your room and board goes with you. They generally put you up with a homestay family that they pay actually to feed and shelter you while you're there. And then most people stay on and actually travel. This is one of the things that makes people incredibly interesting. 
I will tell you the first time ever I ever met Angelina Jolie was because I had just got back from Machu Picchu. I was at a meeting for Disney. She was in the same room. The word got around that I just got back to Machu Picchu and Angelina Jolie herself walked over to me and said, allow me to introduce myself. Like she needed an introduction. And we had a five minute con conversation then because she was about to head there with her family to see Machu Picchu. And so when we look at these particular things, the travel makes you interesting. It makes you exciting. It makes you different. And if you have those shared experiences, particularly in a job interview or with someone that you find very interesting, it is an immediate connection. Traveling is pretty cheap once you get to a particular place, and that's because you'd be traveling as a student. As a student, most of the admissions into, um, whether it's churches or most of the admissions into museums is absolutely free, or it's like a buck 50, it's very cheap. If you stay at a hostel, which is where most people stay, these are places, and they have these all over the United States as well. So there's hostels in New York City you can stay at for $32 a night, which is a steal versus the 300 or $200 a night you might spend elsewhere. And they're in some of the nicer areas of the, the area too. There's one in Washington, D.C., right down actually from the Capitol building and from the White House. There, so you get $30, you get these rooms over here. You share a room with a number of people. They give you a little locked area so you have some place to lock. They have Wi-Fi, they have internet, and you have tourists and students from all over the world that you get to interact with. You might have a Chinese tourist, a uh, Japanese tourist, uh, someone from Denmark, and you generally make friends with these individuals. You might even start traveling with some of them. Breakfast is always included in free. That's here. And so what most hostels students do is they pocket an extra piece of bread, an extra piece of fruit, two pieces of fruit, and now you have free lunch. So all you've got to pay for dinner. And so it's a very easy, cheap way of, of traveling that makes you way much more interesting. And it comes to the, oh, the places you'll go. I mean, when I go individuals, I am often not always the most interesting person in the room, but I am generally the best traveled person in the room, unless there's celebrities and other one there. But what Mark Twain said is travel is fatal to prejudice, bigotry, and narrow-mindedness, because you actually see how other people live and what they care about. Remember from what I talked about before, people have common concern, but different responses based upon the natural resources and things that are there. So here's me and my family traveling. I always travel with business trips. I, we, as a community college professor, we don't make that much money because we want to be there teaching. And you know that's why our, our tuition is much cheaper than at a four-year institution. We'll have individuals that really wanna help out the next generation. And I wish I had someone guiding me along before I got into um, economic debt because of all the loans that I took out. No one ever had that conversation. Like many of you, I'm the first generation college student um, and just didn't have the background wherewithal to know what I was doing. So since then, I've actually traveled with the United Nations to Africa. So here's my wife and daughter learning a Maasai dance in an area where we were staying right outside here. That's right outside of Serengeti, a national park where the annual wildebeest migration happens. Here's us with my really little guys. You can see how they've grown. But this is about a decade ago. We climbed Mount Fuji. We are the only white people climbing Mount Fuji on that particular day. And my son made it all the way to the top in two days. I was so proud. But then he collapsed with those tiny little four-year-old legs. And I had to carry him literally collapsed all the way down the mountain. And then finally, us at the Great Wall of China five years ago. And so we have the opportunity of traveling because I will accept work. And rather than accepting a salary from the work, I will negotiate, and we'll talk about negotiation later on in this class, but I'll negotiate and say, just give me a free trip with my family and you pay, because they already are paying for the hotel room. So they're basically paying for three extra meals, hotel arrangements, if we do need a second hotel, but there's only four of us. So most uh, hotel accommodations that, and then the transportation for um, my family. It ends up being pretty cheap within the process. So there are ways of working that out in the future as well. So for those of you that are fans of The Daily Show, that was Trevor Noah. And I'm, I saw, I apologize about the video, it was awful, or the, the audio. But it says, this is one of the most 100 people, white people artworks. He's from South Africa. Um, he's African-skinned, uh, black African-skinned, um, even though he's a light-skinned African. And so he talked, he talked about the artworks that changed the world. This is probably the hallmark of Roman architecture. This is the Pantheon. It's from 125 to 128 CE, again, three years, and generally considered the greatest architectural achievement of ancient Rome. Note in the very front, it's gorgeous, as you can see here. 
On the side, it's terribly ugly. If you look back behind the dome and the way that it actually moves, it's all concrete. You were only ever meant, kind of like within the, the Parthenon in ancient Greece, to approach from the front and not see this area over here. But now there's modern day roads that lead everywhere here. What makes this artwork spectacular is that when you walk in, you are just not prepared for what you're about to see. And so as you walk in, you see this huge open space. Note, there's no columns. There's no giant arc. It's just open. This is the largest dome that we make in antiquity. There's only one dome that's a little bit larger and really takes this new military technology to make something larger. And that's when we invent rivets and steel and we make things like the Superdome today. This is still one of the largest domes, freestanding domes on the planet, even today, 2,000 years after it was made. It still stands in an area where World War II took place. I mean, this area was bombed all around it, where we had earthquakes. So this is the invention and the perfection of the dome. We do believe the architect was Apollodorus of Damascus, or it could have been Hadrian's architects. We don't have definitive evidence. It is Hadrian who actually commissions it, so it is him who actually gets comments on it. Hadrian and Marcus Agrippa, as you can see up here, his name shows up right there. You'll note on the outside, we don't have the Doric and we don't have the Ionic. We have the Greek-inspired Corinthian columns. Why? Because the, the Romans are not a democracy. They are a republic. They do do some democratic votes, but it's all based upon the rule of law. That's a republic. Hadrian was so upset with Apollodorus' criticism on his earlier domes that he ordered Apollodorus to commit suicide. And that's why we're not sure this was Apollodorus of Damascus or one of Hadrian's architects. But when you walk in and look up, you can see the overwhelming arch. It's unlike any other spatial contemption later on. After the fall of Rome and we move into the Dark Ages, it takes us about a thousand years to rebuild this type of technology. It will take us all the way to art history too. So we won't see a lot of other domes in Western or in Eastern Europe during this time period. We will, or I'm sorry, Western Europe during this time period. We'll see some in Constantinople for the Byzantines, which is the continuation of the Roman Empire, but really nothing in France, Germany, Italy, up until the Renaissance. And when you walk in, it is supposed to be the perfection of man plus the perfection of God. Because if you think about it, the perfection of man is the shape that is man perfected. That's the square. You don't find squares in nature find it almost nowhere until we invent the microscope and we start looking at crystalline structure of things. Everything is square. Perfection of God has no beginning, no end. That's the circle. Put those two shapes together, the perfection, perfection of man on the square shape on the very base and the perfection of God on the top, and you have a unity of the two. And that's why this pantheon, building designs for pan, all, theo, gods, for all the gods, it's used throughout the world for all sorts of religious architecture one gets in, once it gets invented. When you walk into the Pantheon, the first thing you do is look up. That's my little guy's son uh, about five years ago when we were at the Pantheon, looking straight up, and he couldn't stop looking straight up. For a wonderful, wonderful meal overlooking the Pantheon, you can see us, that is the place where we had dinner right across from the Pantheon. I highly, highly, highly recommend it. They have fantastic um, mastacholi. They also have something that is um, called um, matriani, which is a particular sauce. Um, it's called bucatini, which is a tiny little noodle that is hollow and has bacon pancetta put in it. And it's a matriani, um, basically a tomato-based sauce. It is fantastic. It's one of the best meals we've ever had. All four of us ordered that, and we finish off every little bit of it. So I highly recommend it at that restaurant, right across from the Pantheon. The dome is the perfection of man and God. And that's why once the dome gets invented at the, the um, Pantheon, we're going to move and we're going to see it in Christian buildings. That's St. Peter's, the Pope's personal church. In Islam, that's the Prophet's Mosque. In Hinduism, that is actually a very famous temple in southern India. And in Judaism. Why? Because it is the perfection of God and man coming together. And that is about as good as you can get for a religious building. The way the dome works is the dome comes up with that circular shape. The problem is all the way at the top of the dome, this area, that hole is called an oculus. It is the weakest spot. So what the Romans did is they actually just cleared it out and left it like the all-seeing eye of God. Often in Christian churches, we'll leave it open and we'll put some kind of lantern or something on the very top that allows sun rays to come in, but also does not allow 
um, birds to come in, for example, or rain to come into your church. In order to lighten the load, each of these coffers, you'll note up here, they're recessed. Each one then lightens the load as you move to the top. They get thicker and thicker recessed. And to make sure that in the concrete fill, they actually put hollow jars. And so that would basically be air pockets to lighten the load all the way up. On the outside, the, the major pressure that shows up is that on the very top, they want to push out. So with the Roman cities, they put string courses of rock around it, basically like rubber bands to hold that shape in place. And all of these together with a 20 foot thick buttress wall behind the entrance, that's really what we are looking at. I mean, we're looking at buttressing. Again, human architecture. Buttress is like two people standing next to one another, butt to butt, and another person, butt to butt, that's a buttress, making very thick walls that will support something that's lighter on top. All done because we have actually indented concrete or the Romans invented concrete. It's a remarkable accomplishment. It still stands today. Later on the Dark Ages, they're gonna call this the House of Devils because they have no idea about how it's being held up unless Satan himself is holding this up, honoring all of the gods from the ancient Roman world. Out front, there are Corinthian columns that symbolize the Republic like Rome. And the Senate met on the front porch to discuss politics and make laws, never underneath the dome. Why do you think that is? Why would the Senate meet on the front porch to discuss politics and not underneath the dome? That is exactly right. It gives us our modern day interpretation of the separation of church and state. And so if you look at ours to prove to you that we are a republic, as I've mentioned twice so far in this lecture, look at our I Pledge of Allegiance. I Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic. republic. So we better know what a republic is. What form of government does the United States have? We're a representative democracy and a republic. A republic is a government of elected officials with a common set of laws. The Roman had the law of the 12 tablets. We have our constitution. Why are these US government buildings modeled after the Pantheon in particular? Why the Capitol building? Well, we are a republic, that's where our laws get made. Why the Jefferson Memorial? Note here you can actually even see the string tool course on the outside. This is about one third the scale of the actual Pantheon. Why the Jefferson Memorial where the Jefferson statue is? Remember from your history, he is actually one of the people that helps frame the constitution, framing us as a republic, but he also actually outright writes the US Declaration of Independence saying that we are independent and free. So basically he gets a shout out for helping to create our government here. Now the weird thing, or one of the weird things that shows up in the Pantheon, from our world versus back then, is that they worship their gods very differently. Remember, their gods sometimes behave behaving badly. So that's an image of Zeus on the right. He's got three rapes, at least 12 bastard kids, 35 people different torture. And so you feared Zeus and loved his power, but you didn't really love Zeus. You feared him more than anything else in the ancient Greco-Roman world. Not like loving God like we generally do in the Christian, Jewish, or Muslim world today. And remember, all the gods are being worshipped here. So before you went in, you would buy a cursed stone. Now, 90% of what the, when you approached a god, would be curses rather than saying, can you please make my son healthy? You would rather say, can you please kill the bastard that made my son sick? So you would write them on the cursed stones. The bigger the stone, the more likely it is the god, because they were kind of like us. They're vindictive. They're jealous. And so let's say that one of you, I really don't like for some reason. I'm going to buy myself a curse stone before I go into the pantheon and say, well, I, oh, let's do Jeremy. Jeremy, I really hate you. I hope Jeremy dies so he doesn't have to take my final. I don't have to fail him so I don't feel badly about it. He's just not a good student. I would put the curse stone on Zeus or on whatever god that I want because this is for all the gods. Jeremy sees me writing that. So Jeremy's pissed. So Jeremy goes by his, uh, a bigger curse stone. Frazier, his tests are too hard. He doesn't really teach. He sucks as a professor. I want him dead. I want his family dead. And you would buy, put that bigger one on top. Who is Zeus most likely going to fulfill the wish for? Who should fulfill the wish? Probably for Jeremy, who invested more money within the process. And so they actually have cursed stone graveyards that we've actually found where these are buried after they come true. The Parthenon, the Colosseum, as we're comparing um, the idea of Greek and Roman architecture. So stop the video for a moment and take a look and try to figure out how they're similar and different. And I'll give you a moment to do this, and then we'll move on to the slide so you can see 
what class came up with. So how are they similar? Beauty features, they both are based upon columns. Sculptural decoration, both have the 2x plus 1 model. Both have marble decoration. But Greece, remember, is made of marble. That's why they fall. The construction is all marble. So when it cracks, you have to replace everything. And marble is difficult and not very stable. Doric and Ionic and based upon visual perfection. In Rome, why is it so standard today? Concrete construction, marble decoration. And so if the marble breaks, just put another piece of marble on the outside. The building still stands. Corinthian columns representing the Republic. Perfection of math, which makes it much more stable. Domes, growing vaults, arches, all which are much cheaper um, and much more stable once we get them up. All except for the dome. The dome is actually an expense, but we don't see it very often. The Romans are also going to invent public baths. What makes the public bath interesting is that they are generally gifts for the citizens from the emperor. Basically propaganda. Please love me. Look at the gifts that I am giving you. They are free of charge for wealthy to slave. Think about the last time when a sporting contest or something that it was so grandiose is absolutely free and a gift from the government to go and do. Maybe we have public parks, but even national parks today charge us to go into them. Men and women have separate facilities, but look, women are going to have a little bit more rights than they did in ancient Greece. And there's gonna be libraries and gyms that are there. Now you are there for your own edification, for your own, remember there is a professional army. So you are no longer in charge of staying absolutely in the shape, in the best shape of your life all the time to protect your family. We have a professional army that now does that. There's a frigidarium, a really cold bath that you would go into to stop sweating after you worked out. There are heated baths for men only. And underneath this, there would be actually a wood burning fire pit where slaves would literally just be pounding wood that might be 130 degrees. That's going to heat and boil the water for you. And that brings us to the end of architecture and really where Rome starts to fall. Part of it due to their own incestuous relationships Remember, they are marrying people that they believe are their sisters because they have more God blood than you and I and a commoner. Over a period of hundreds of years, this really does start to impact the progeny in the line. And, you know, we have emperors that are born with six toes, six fingers that can't walk, that are hunched over like hobbits, that have mental kind of, and many mental issues that allow them to justify terrible, terrible torture of behaviors of their enemies or even of their friends that they get paranoid about. So based upon the visual aesthetics, what time period that we have studies this artwork from? Are the artwork, I don't care if you know the right answer. Again, this is one of those where you can get an A and get the wrong answer or an F with the right answer. Because what it's asking you to do is argue the visual elements. How well can you make a visual argument based upon this artwork? Are the features Mesopotamian, Egyptian, Greece, or Rome? And I'll give you a couple minutes to do this. And we will have done this in class as well. And so as you look at the Tetrarch, the Tetrarch is actually Roman. But if you look at the features, the columnar bodies, the stylized face, the open eyes, the very non-realistic poses, it really looks like a combination, probably a little bit more Mesopotamian, but with a little Egyptian. And the only thing that's Greek then is the costume. I'm sorry, the only thing that's Roman then is the costume. It looks nothing like ancient Greece. So ancient Greece should have been nowhere on your list. Mostly Mesopotamian, touches of Egypt, clothing and sword work that basically even eagle head sword, you can see it, that's an eagle head sword. And so that's what happened. At the end of each art history time period, there is a dramatic change in the arts. It's as if artists understand that their civilization is failing. The Romans saw it coming. They saw it and look at the Tetrarchs. Look how different the Tetrarchs looks than, than the Augustus of Porta, the emperor who's basically saying, I got this for all of eternity with his figure and the masculine idea of the toga, the philosopher king and the military hero that shows up. The Tetrarchs are basically looking out for themselves, knowing that their civilization is going to fall. The ancient Greek over there, the Hellenistic artwork on the bottom, of course they know their, their civilization is going to fall. They have emotion, theatricality, drum, which we didn't see in any other art period. The Egyptian period above, we see the exact same thing. That is a weird feature that looks nothing like Egyptian art from either composite pose or from the more realistic bodies. That is a weird curvilinear figure that we don't see in any other period of Egyptian period and Egyptian art. The artists and the philosophers see when their society is in trouble. 
don't believe me. Look at the combination between these two. Who do you want leading you? Clearly, you want Augusta Suprema Porta. Unless you like anarchy and death and like to fight and kill people on your own and protect your own, you're not going to like the Tetrarchs, right? Those are individuals that are fearful for men doing basically not even the job of one great emperor from before. So the question that's going to dodge us for next time is, based upon her arts, is America's superpower status in trouble? If you look at the difference between 1917 and 2019, and 1930 and 2004 for portraiture, if our society and our, the concepts and the ideas behind our art start to change and artists know it, maybe we are in trouble. We'll come back and talk about that as we talk about the fall of Rome next time and end our Roman and the, the beginning of the classical world. Have a wonderful day, and I hope everything is well. Bye.